On July 4th, 1976, our country was celebrating their 200th birthday, the bicentennial. And New York City put on a tremendous fireworks display out in the New York City Harbor with Lady Liberty in the background. And I know that because Carol and I were watching that that day. I it was in New Jersey. It was six days before our wedding. And we were, I think, on the Jersey side watching this incredible fireworks display in the New York City Harbor. While we were watching that display, at least the same night we were watching that display, one of the most incredible rescues in all of history was taking place in Uganda at the Entebbe Airport that same night. I don't know if you remember this, but about a week before, on the 27th of June, a, an Israeli, it was actually an Air France flight, was hijacked. It left Tel Aviv, it was supposed to go to Paris, but some Palestinian uh, hijackers, or terrorists perhaps, hijacked the plane and diverted it to Uganda where uh, their dictator, Idi Amin, was friendly towards them. And they, there were 248 passengers on the plane. They were only interested in the 94 Israelis who were there. They let the rest of the, the prisoners go or the passengers go, but they held on to 94 Israeli uh, citizens and they threatened to kill all of them if the Israelis didn't release about 54 Palestinian um, prisoners that were being held by the Israelis. And you know how the Israelis are about negotiating with terrorists. It's, they don't do that. And they immediately began training this group of commandos. There were a hundred commandos that they trained in one week. Uh, they put them on a flight on July 4th, 1976. They flew them 2,500 miles into Uganda. And they, the prisoners, the Israeli prisoners had been put in a, a kind of a part of the airport there at uh, Entebbe, in kind of a warehouse area, and the uh, Israeli commandos went in there and they shouted in Hebrew to get down, hit the floor, and all the Jews hit the floor and everybody standing was killed. All the, all the, um, all the guards, all the Palestinian terrorists were killed. It was an amazing, the entire rescue took 90 minutes and not a single hostage was killed. There were five uh, Israeli commandos who were wounded, but only one died, and he was the one who was the head of the entire operation. Uh, was, he was the only one who was killed. His name is somewhat familiar to you. His name was Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Netanyahu. His younger brother is the current Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. That was all taking place while the same night we're out there watching fireworks on on July 4th, 1976. An amazing rescue. If you haven't seen it, there are several movies made about the rescue at Entebbe. It'd be worth uh, looking up. You, it's an amazing uh, story. Amazing movies have been made out of it. But it's probably not the greatest rescue in all of history. In fact, um, an, an even more incredible rescue is uh, described in Acts chapter 12. And we're going to read about it today. Before we read it, let me just say that the theme of rescue is all throughout the Bible. The, the big theme is, is described as liberation from bondage. Mankind is in bondage. He's a slave and he's a prisoner and God sets him free. And you see it all throughout the New Testament. You see it all throughout the Old Testament, I mean, in both Testaments. And the classic example in the Bible is when God set the the Israeli, the people of Israel, free from slavery in Egypt. And you'll recall when he did that, uh, on the night that he set them free, uh, they celebrated the Passover because the tenth plague was the angel of death was going to pass over the houses that had the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. And that day they, they made unleavened bread so, because they didn't have time for the bread to rise and they ate the unleavened bread on the night of the Passover. And every year after that, the Jewish people celebrated Passover. And it was when they were celebrating Passover that on the night they celebrated Passover that Jesus was arrested. And it was on the night they were celebrating Passover that Peter is arrested here in chapter 12. And we'll read about it here at the beginning of this chapter. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. 
When he saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. That's the Passover. So the same time of year that Jesus was arrested, Peter is arrested. And he's arrested by King Herod. You know the name King Herod. What you may not know is that there are seven Herods mentioned in the New Testament. The, there was uh, the Herod who was, th this Herod right here who arrested Peter was the grandson of Herod the Great. He was the one who was ruling when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He's the one to whom the wise men came asking where the king of the Jews was born. And he's the one who decreed that every baby under three would be killed trying to uh, kill Jesus, trying to kill uh, his replacement as the king of the Jews. That was Herod the Great. Now, this Herod also had, had an uncle named Herod Antipas who had John the Baptist beheaded. These were violent people, these Herods, and they, they all had one thing in common. They were kind of illegitimate kings, illegitimate rulers who were propped up by the Romans, and they would do anything to protect their position, and they would kill anybody necessary. And when Herod saw that it pleased the Jews, he was doing this to protect his position. He had James, the brother of John, one of the 12 disciples, had him arrested and it says here he was killed by the sword. That meant that they cut his head off. And then after that, they arrested Peter. Now, before we talk about Peter, let me just talk for a minute about James, the one whose head was cut off. Because it's great to talk about this rescue of Peter, and it's exciting to talk about the rescue of Peter, but sometimes God does not intervene. And I think it's important for us to understand that. Because you could get the impression that every time a person goes to prison, if we pray for him, that God's going to set him free. But that's not the case. Because just before Peter was arrested, James was arrested. And do you think the people, the, the Christians in their day, prayed any less for James than they did for Peter? Of course not. You know that they were praying for James when he was in prison. You know that they prayed that he would be set free. And God did not intervene in that case. And James was killed by the sword. That confuses us, frankly. Why does he intercede for Peter and, and set him free, as we'll read in a few minutes, and why did he not intervene with James? Today, we pray for people with cancer. Sometimes we get this miraculous report that where they went into the doctor before and the x-ray showed them full of cancer. Christians pray for them and they go back and the cancer's gone. And we rejoice and praise God. But there are other times when they go back and the cancer is still there, and the cancer is worse, and they die. And we prayed for both people, and we prayed in faith, believing for both people. Sometimes God intervenes, and sometimes he does not. Why is that? It is, we don't always know. But it's important to understand that God is God, and he is in control, and he will make these decisions. It's not up to us. But it's not, it would be misleading to say that every time we pray for somebody, to, to be set free from prison as we're praying right now for Pastor Saeed and we're wondering why hasn't he been set free from prison? He's been there a long time. God is God and God is in control and he, his timing is, will be perfect when he uh, decides to do that. James died in prison. When Peter was arrested, he must have believed he was going to be killed. Of course. It's, this is Herod, who, the, the King Herod, who has killed James. He, he found that it pleased the Jews because the Christian church was growing so, so rapidly. That's what we've talked about the last few weeks. Peter got up and preached a sermon. 3,000 people came to know Christ. He healed a man who was lame, and the people came out and saw the miracle. Now the group grew to 5,000, and the Christian church is exploding with growth. The Jews are desperate to try to stop this, and they've got to partner with King Herod, who is willing to arrest Christians and Christian leaders, the leaders of this radical new church, and he's willing to kill them. And King Herod has already done it, now he arrests Peter, and Peter must have believed that he was going to die, and the church must have believed that Peter was going to be killed, just like James was, because the church began to pray. Let's read what happens in verse 4. After arresting him, he put him in prison, 
handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Peter was in an impossible situation. There was no possible way. When they heard that Peter was arrested, they did not send in a team of Navy SEALs to go get him out. Uh, they, the church began to pray. A team of Navy SEALs probably couldn't have gotten him out anyway because he had two guards on each side. He was chained to two guards, and there were two more guards that were watching the door. There was no way a, a fisherman like Peter was going to somehow uh, wrestle these guys to the ground. They must have thought he was like a superstar, a, a superhero, to have two guys chained to him and two guys on the door. But there was no way Peter was going to outmuscle these guys and get rip the chains off and escape from prison. So the church decides the only thing and the best thing to do is to pray. Now, R.A. Torrey wrote a book years ago called The Power of Prayer, and he referenced this passage, this sentence. And he said he, he believes there's a formula for prayer here, and I'll present it to you and see what you think. The word says that the church, um, it says after, after they arrested, the church was earnestly praying to God for him. And he breaks that down, and he takes the word earnestly. They were praying earnestly. Do you know what it means to pray earnestly? It's to pray with, a, with an intensity. Um, there's a man in the New Testament named Epaphras, not mentioned very often, but he's kind of one of my heroes. He's mentioned in Colossians 4.12. And Paul says, Epaphras is always wrestling in prayer for us. Well, I, I wrestled for seven years in high school and college, and I know that wrestling is intense. It is not a casual sport. I, I, all those years, I wished I'd gone out for the golf team because it just is a brutal sport, and it's hard, and it's, every, every practice is intense. So when I hear that he was wrestling in prayer, I know that that's a battle, and I know that that's what prayer is like, and you know that too. Prayer is not an easy thing. If you, wanna, if you are committed to prayer, you have to wrestle in prayer. And if you, if, if you have a loved one who is dying, and, and, is, and you pray intensely for that person, it is exhausting, it's, a, it's, it's intense. And that's how they were praying it. They were praying earnestly. And then it says the church was praying earnestly. So when it says the church, it meant they were united in prayer. They didn't scatter and go pray by themselves. They gathered together in one place behind locked doors, and they prayed earnestly for Peter. There is something very powerful about united prayer, about corporate prayer, when we pray together on Sunday morning, we are agreeing together in prayer, and all of us together are agreeing and lifting up these prayers to God. There's something powerful about that. And this was a powerful prayer meeting that took place when the church gathered together and they prayed earnestly. And then it says they prayed unto God. Well, you might say, well, of course they prayed unto God, but in fact, not all prayers are unto God. There are a lot of people today who, in fact, across our country, the vast majority of people pray. But some of them are praying to Mother Earth, and some of them might be praying to other gods, whether it's Allah or Buddha or anybody else. And the prayers that are effective are the prayers unto God. Because you realize it's not really prayer that heals. We use that term, you know, prayer, prayer heals and prayer does this. But it's the object of our prayers. It's God who heals. And it's the object of your prayer that is important. It's not the prayer itself, but it's who are you praying to. And if you're not praying unto God, then that prayer is useless. But this, these people prayed earnestly, together as a church, unto God. And then it says they prayed for him. They had a specific target in their prayers. Their prayers weren't general, like, God, help all the missionaries. That was the prayer we always prayed. You know, just save everybody and that type of thing. He, they were praying for Peter specific prayers for him, and they prayed specifically. So there's quite a bit in that one phrase uh, that we can learn just about prayer. But I want you to watch how God answered their prayer, and it starts in verse 6. It says, The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, which would be difficult for me. I don't know how he did that. Bound, bound with two chains, 
and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. I think Peter was soundly asleep because it doesn't say he nudged him. He struck him on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison. But look what, he, look, look what this says. He had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. Peter thought he was going to wake up and be back chained between these two guys and go, that was a cool dream. He didn't even realize this was real because it was so amazing. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And listen, look at what it says. It opened for them by itself. Now that doesn't amaze us so much because that happens every time you go to the mall. Every time you go to the grocery store, the doors open by themselves. But these were iron gates that were chained shut and locked and these doors just opened by themselves. And they went through it. When they walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Here comes, here's Peter. He's out in the middle of the street, and the angel leaves him. And look what it says. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches, from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. To me, that makes the rescue at Entebbe look tame. I mean, this, was, this is an amazing rescue, a supernatural rescue. The rescue at Entebbe was the best of what man can do in, with these commandos. But this is supernatural when an angel comes in and does something that only God can do. What happened to Peter was so strange that he didn't even believe it. He didn't even think it was real because things like that just don't happen. He kept thinking he was going to just wake up and, and it wouldn't be real. Instead, he finds himself standing outside uh, in the street and he's free. He has been set free from God. He believed, I believe, when he fell asleep that night, that he was, the next morning he would be put on trial and killed. I think that's how Peter fell asleep. And then he finds himself standing outside on a street and he is free. He has been set free by God. The angel, I mean, God sent an angel to do this miracle. The chains fell off, the door opened by itself, and no guard stopped him. Not a single guard tried to stop him. People ask a lot about angels. People are fascinated by angels today. There's books about angels, there's TV shows, there's movies about angels. They're fascinated. People wonder, do angels still do that kind of stuff? Are there still angels out there? Because we can't see them physically for the most part. At least we don't know. There was a girl that um, Carol and I knew in Massachusetts. Her name was Faith Carter. She'd been in a wheelchair uh, her whole life. And um, when she was in her 20s, she was a very bold person, very independent, and she decided to go off to college by herself. And uh, she was in a wheelchair, and she had peop you know, healthcare people who would come in and help her out. And one time she had to go to a, uh, a meeting or a class that was in a building where she'd never been. And she's on, in a wheelchair, and the, there was construction at, in this building. The stairs that were there and the, and the wheelchair ramp and everything was under construction. And somebody had put like a, a plywood ramp there to replace the regular wheelchair ramp. And she tried to go up the plywood ramp, but it was too steep. And as she was going up, her wheelchair began to tip backwards. Now, I can imagine that this would be a terrifying moment when she realizes she's lost control and she's going to tip backwards. And the next thing she expects is to hit her head on the cement or on the, on the ground. And she's waiting, she's ready for that, tensing herself, when suddenly she said, somebody caught the wheelchair. Somebody said, I've got it, and pushed her up the ramp. When she got to the top of the ramp, she turned around to thank the person, and there was nobody there. She could see quite a distance. There was nobody anywhere close to her. 
and faith was convinced it was an angel. There was no other explanation. I mean, you can try to come up with one. I, I haven't really tried to come up with one, but I couldn't if I did. It was an angel. An angel set Peter free in the most miraculous way. And now he's going to go to this prayer meeting, and this is where the story gets a little bit humorous. Look at verse 12. When, they, when this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. Let's just pause for a moment here because I love the fact that we know the servant girl's name. Isn't that amazing? Her name's Rhoda. 2,000 years later, we all know the servant girl's name. We don't know the names of many of the people at that Bible study, that prayer meeting. There were probably some really important people at that, at that uh, prayer meeting. The least important person at the prayer meeting was Rhoda because she was the one who had to go answer the door while they were doing the important work of praying. The least important person is the one name that we all know, and it's Rhoda. And we really know her because she was kind of negligent, or at least she was excited. She was so excited, she did recognize Peter's voice. Now, she knew they were praying for Peter. She knew Peter was locked in prison. She knew Peter was going to die. And she now knows that Peter is at the door. And she's so excited, she doesn't open the door. She leaves him standing there, and she runs back to the prayer meeting. And you've got to see the reaction of these prayer warriors who are in the prayer meeting at this moment. Look at their reaction in verse 15. So when she says, Peter is at the door, they say, you're out of your mind. <laughs> what? They say, you're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking. <laughs> Here's old Peter. He's out there at the door, and he's, he's still knocking at the door. Would somebody please let me in here? Peter kept on knocking, when, and when they opened the door and saw it was him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet, and he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Can you imagine their faces when Peter told them that story? He got them quiet, and he said, let me tell you what just happened to me. Can you imagine their faces? As they were sitting there praying, at the very moment they were sitting there praying for him to be released, he says, while you were praying, an angel whacked me in the side, woke me up. My chains fell off. They fell off my hands. I got up and the doors opened by themselves. Nobody tried to stop us. I found myself out in the street and the angel was gone. Can you imagine their faces? I think their jaws were dropped open, their eyes were huge. It says they were astonished. So why, were, why are we always surprised when God answers a prayer? Why are, why are they shocked? Because that's what they were praying for. And they were praying in faith, believing that God can answer their prayers. But when he did, they were just stunned by it. You know, I have to be honest with you. The same thing happens to me every time God answers a prayer. I know I'm not supposed to be surprised. I'm supposed to expect a miracle and all these things. But when it happens, I'm just so amazed every single time. It never loses its thrill. And these people were just shocked and astonished that, that God had set him free so miraculously. One of the questions people ask, like the angel, is these New Testament kind of miracles, does this still happen today? Back in 2001, after watching the Jesus film over in Afghanistan, there was a, a Muslim that was uh, named Samuel. He had listened to Christian radio, he watched the Jesus film, and he did something that was very, very strange and unusual for an Afghan Muslim. He gave his life to Jesus Christ. He surrendered his life to Jesus Christ and became a follower of Christ. Well, soon after that, the Taliban came for him, and they arrested him. 
they said that he was guilty of working for foreigners. Uh, they trumped up some charges and they threw him in jail. The first 14 days he was in jail, they beat him at least once a day, often severely, often leaving him unconscious on the floor of the cell. Then that night, 14 days later, Samuel had a dream. He said, these are his words, he said, a luminous man wearing bright white clothes appeared. And then he said, the visitor, he, and I, I got to tell you, part of his description must be cultural because he said he had very beautiful feet. I, I don't know why he noticed that, but he, he said he had very beautiful feet and shoulder length hair. That's how he described this man. But he said the visitor spoke kindly to him. And the visitor said, get up. He had a dream, and in his dream, he saw the visitor lead him out of jail. And then he woke up from his dream, and when he woke up, his cell door was open. Well, he walked through the cell door, and he walked through the front gate of the prison. It was unguarded, and it was open, and he walked out into the night. It was so similar to what happened to Peter. And this happened in 2001. Does God still do miracles? See, God is the same yesterday and today and forever. He never changes. He still does the exact same things he did then. He still answers prayers. He still does miracles. And he still sets prisoners free. Let's pray together. Almighty God, there is nothing that's impossible for you. There is nothing that's too wonderful for you to do. Lord, help us to pray as if we believe that was true. Lord, help us to believe when we pray for these miraculous rescues, for miraculous miracles, that you are still the God of miracles. Help us to pray in faith, believing. Lord, we, are, we love you and we praise you for being a God who, who cares about us and who is able to save us. And you set us free from sin and from slavery to Satan, and you set prisoners free. Lord, today, when there are so many Christians who are in prison for their faith, we continue to come to you like the disciples did in the first century and pray, God, for your mighty, powerful hand upon them. We love you. We believe in you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.